Hello everyone, thanks a lot for sticking around for Find Your Niche, How Indies Can Thrive in the Free-to-Play Mobile Market. Uh, I know it's lunchtime, so I'll try to make it fun, interesting, and uh, hope you're not starving. Um, but before, before I start, I, I'd like to get a little bit of sense of who is who in the audience, get a sense of who is a, well, I'll see some of you guys that I know, but who is a mobile game developer uh, in the audience? All right, okay, great. Now, who's a mobile game independent developer? Okay, perfect, almost the same number. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, this presentation is, is uh, focused for you guys, and I hope you'll find some interesting stuff there. So start talking a little bit about me. So I, I, uh, uh, my name is Samir Lajili. I've been in the mobile game industry for um, uh, over 12 years. Actually, I think it's 13 at this point. I decided to wear exactly the same shirt in this picture that I have now on. <laughs> And uh, so I started, I worked for 12 years at a company called Gameloft, which is now called Vivendi. And I was running uh, all studios in US and South America, which represent around nine studios. Um, uh, among that time, I built around 50 games with these very talented folks that were hired. And, and uh, uh, some of them were great games, some of them were average, some of them were pretty bad. Uh, and obviously, as we all know, we learn essentially from the mistakes we make, especially in a free play space. Um, it's funny because I love to say 50 games, but if you uh, look back over the period of time, obviously in 2004, making a mobile game was one person and a half over three months. And in 2014, if you look at games like Spider-Man Unlimited or Ice Age Village, you're talking about teams of 100 people over a period of two years with gigantic budgets. So obviously things have greatly changed since then. Um, and uh, for a year now, I've been the chief product officer at Tilting Point. And Tilting Point is a mobile publishing partner. Um, we like the word partner to differentiate us a little bit from, from the rest because what we do is we really try to build long-term partnership with, um, with you guys, independent developers, uh, try to work on games, not just for um, soft launch and launch, but uh, realize that free-to-play is about um, a three-year, four-year, five-years partnership. And if you want to make it successful, games have to be worked on for that long in live operations. And this is what we aim to do. We have built a team of 30 guys which are really experts in free-to-play. Uh, guys that come from uh, you know, uh, big companies that worked on, on big uh, games, ran live off for three years, Kabam, Gameloft, Electronic Arts, etc. And uh, we uh, have not always actually done free to play. Our biggest success is a game called Leo's Fortune, which is a fantastic uh, game from a fantastic independent developer, but it's pay to play. Um, uh, although, as we know, today it's difficult to uh, make a game, a very big and successful game in that, in that market. That's why we shifted more towards the free-to-play market. Uh, Leo's Fortune is on multiple platforms, so we work on multiple platforms as well. All our games have always been featured um, uh, on the App Store, and uh, Leo's Fortune is a game that that is his choice and was featured on stage. All right, enough about us. Let's talk about the real point of this presentation, which is... Uh, about niche games. So I, I'll start with a very obvious statement, which is good for all of us, which is the mobile game industry is still growing very fast. Um, and that's great news. But you know, looking a little bit more at how it's been growing over the years, this is a pretty staggering chart that we've all seen in multiple presentations. But the interesting point that I want to show here is that if you look at 2013, the top 10, uh, it was, uh, the market for that was $3 billion. If you look at 2015, it's $4.7 billion. So that obviously hit driven business is the big chunk of the revenue. But if you look at the top 200, to top 1,000, and you look at 2013, it was 1.5 billion, and now it's a 3 billion market. So actually what this is saying is that the top 200 to 1,000 grossing has grown faster uh, than the top 10. So there's a lot of room uh, for that, that uh, uh, segment of top 200 to top 1,000 grossing games. All these games make at least a million dollars. 
So another statement that we've heard multiple times that we all know, success barriers are rising for the pen developers. They're extremely high at this point. Uh, we like to say the barriers to entries are still very low, but the success uh, barriers are very, very high. Uh, and uh, this is an example showing that. Um, 2012, there were 42 games in the top 100 grossing games that were uh, from independent developers. In 2015, there were only 13, and probably 2016, a little bit less. Another point, which is that actually was, you know, I finished that two days ago, and I was pretty staggered by the, the acceleration of this curve, the number of games releasing every month on iOS worldwide. Um, and if you look, uh, uh, what's surprising to me is it's still growing. Uh, I think we're probably reaching a peak at this point, and in next year should be dropping a little bit because, I mean, 25, over 25,000 games releasing a month seems uh, a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're probably going to see a lot of uh, uh, independent developers uh, moving to other platforms or be acquired by bigger guys, and this curve should drop. But that makes, obviously, our lives very difficult, because how do you get visible in a market that's so saturated? Of course, what happens when a market gets very saturated, and this is, again, something that's pretty, I'm sure everybody knows this, is that um, you, only, you revert to marketing, and marketing budgets goes up, go up, go up, User acquisition costs have been rising and rising and rising. And uh, this is showing uh, CPIs in the US for iOS and Android, uh, which are on average at 1.4 uh, on iOS and one point, almost $2 on, on Android. So that's uh, extremely high and very difficult for new players to come in. So these are all things we all know. Um, uh, and this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, and the point of this presentation is to highlight a little bit, focus a little bit on, on genre and themes, uh, which, uh, you know, some of them are extremely saturated, and I, and I separated genre and themes here because we see a lot of uh, charts in, uh, comparing CPIs, which is looking at strategy cost per installs or action cost per installs, which I think don't really make sense. A lot of games are different. Um, but we rarely see the comparison of themes. We rarely see medieval fantasy, uh, space, um, you know, uh, candies, uh, and um, it should be. It would be interesting to see a comparison of these themes and how saturated each themes each theme is on uh, on the store. I love this chart because you could do this for multiple genres. Uh, this is obviously. And match three sugary things based on a very well-known game. The icons all look the same. Uh, it's all saturated colors. It's essentially the same gameplay. But let's remember that in user acquisition, people only see videos, carousel, pictures. Um, this is why Game of War is uh, showing Arnold Schwarzenegger running around doing some crazy stuff, which has nothing to do with the game. hope nobody's from Machines on here. <laughs> but in reality, uh, what matters is, uh, in user acquisition, visibility, initially at least, is how your game looks and feel, and how you can advertise it. So what does all this mean? Should we all just uh, give up? Never. I can never do his accent, but I, I like the guy. <laughs> So one solution that I'd like to propose today that we have, got, we have reached quite a little, bit of, a little bit of success here at, at Tilting Point is focusing on a niche. And focusing on a niche from the ground up where you build a game um, to have really a vision of who your customer is going to be and really differentiate yourself from the competition. This sounds pretty obvious, but it, uh, it's not always done. Um, so what, what are the advantages of niche games, and what do we mean by that? Um, obviously, one of them is uh, more targeted user acquisition. So let's say you're working on a match three game. Um, it's going to be, your audience is going to be pretty wide, pretty open, uh, pretty casual. It's going to be very hard when you design the game to focus on a, a, a niche. Or you could you know, figure out, I'm going to do a match three on, for example, a boxing match three for male, but it's a little bit difficult. Um, if you're working on a horse game, for example, horse racing game, you're going to be from the ground up when you're building your game, knowing that your audience is going to be males between the age of 18 and 35, but that really are fan of horses and horse racing. So your, your user acquisition from the soft launch at the, at the start 
of your uh, before your global launch is already really targeted. You don't need to look for it. You already know who these people are. On top of that, they can also be specific to certain geographics. You, you know that horse racing is, uh, doesn't work in Germany, but works really well in uh, Qatar and Hong Kong, for example. So that really helps uh, identifying early on and knowing who your audience is going to be and you're defining your marketing strategy. Another really useful point is that with niche games, uh, you have a high percentage of engaged users. Obviously, this is what we're all looking for in free-to-play, is how to keep and retain those paying users for the longest possible time. So if by design and by theme, your game is attracting people who are already interested in what you're, you're doing, you have a higher chance of retaining them. Let's say you're making a curling game. Well, probably the only people who are going to download your game are people who like curling initially, and they're going to be naturally more retained than the other guys. What comes with that too, uh, I believe, is that you're going to also get uh, their community around them, which are going to be naturally more engaged. Uh, we all talk about how important the community is and free to play, getting the community excited. Um, and the guy who likes curling games is probably very close to somebody else who likes curling, and they're probably both of them going to join your game. So it's going to be, they're going to be um, also more viral as well. Uh, so it's, it's a big piece. Very related, but interesting point is that what we found out is that there's going to be less user acquisition competition resulting in lower CPI. And that could be a little counterintuitive because normally uh, the more targeted you go, the more your CPI goes up, right? I mean, if you're doing, if you're looking um, on Facebook and you do user acquisition campaign for males between the age of 18 and 35, uh, it should cost something. But if you're looking for males between the age of 18 and 35, like horses, it should be higher. But in reality, it's not really because uh, the competition is so aggressive. The big players, uh, which brings me to the last point, are so aggressive that you know, Machine Zone and, 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 and Supercell are spending so much in certain categories, they're up, the CPIs are going really, really high up. So probably if you go for curling, your CPI is going to be low, lower than if you go for just medieval fantasy. Um, and that's, uh, that's an important piece. So you end up finding uh, pockets of opportunities in user acquisition in these games. So uh, here are some examples of indies that we think have found success in niches. Uh, some of them are uh, pretty, uh, we, success is defined in different ways, obviously. What we look at here is games that have had positive user acquisition campaign, very low CPI, and this guy, these guys are profitable. So Virtual Regatta is a, is a game for boating fans, specialized for, for, for these guys, and they've been pretty successful. Bud Farm, a Farmville for stoners, a very specific uh, audience from the ground up. Um, Episode, which very successful, obviously, uh, a lot of competition that fields now, I think, but it used to be a little bit nicher. Choose your own adventure for teen girls. Covered fashion, dress up for older girls. Vainglory is a little bit tricky. I had a big discussion with my team if we should put this in or not. Um, it's the medieval fantasy genre. I think they had an earlier mover advantage, but obviously it's you know mobile for mobile, uh, and uh, it's probably not something we should, somebody should start right now. But uh, when they released, they they had this uh, ability to be uh, pretty unique. Um, and Mohammed Ali Puzzle King, we just talked about match three boxing. Surprising that it works. And fencing sword play. Yes, they made money and they're pretty successful. And so uh, earlier in uh, May this, this year, 2016, uh, Tilting Point partnered up with a very talented independent developer based in Florida called Third Time. Uh, they, uh, the CEO is Ian Cummings, a, a great uh, creative director who worked at Zynga and worked at uh, EA as in creative director position. And uh, he had uh, released a game two months prior called uh, Photo Finish. And this game is basically a mix between going with a proven free-to-play core loop. They really made the exactly same core loop as CSR. Um, we had a proven meta game as well, very similar to CSR, but going for a niche theme, horse racing, um, which brings with it a avid, what I call an avid local fan base. 
and uh, it's a little bit of all the things we talked about. It's local because, again, there's only certain geos that are into horse racing, so you know right away which geos to focus on in user acquisition, and also in your improving your game metrics as well and your game monetization for those specific geos. Um, the game um, was initially released. Um, uh, third time, tried to do some basic user acquisition, but it didn't do um, targeted ones uh, and sophisticated ones. Uh, we partnered up, and we were able to make deliver a marketing plan that's also very in line with all the events. The advantage of sports is that there are so many specific moments where everybody's watching the sports, at least the fans. So summer is a great time for uh, horse racing. I had no idea, but it's the best time. Um, and we were able to link that up with, uh, link our user acquisition campaign initially with the Kentucky Derby, amongst other races. We were able to go to Google and Apple and get the game featured. And even though game, that game was released for almost three months prior and was not really generating great revenue, we multiplied its, uh, uh, its revenue and download tremendously. And the result um, is something that we're very happy with, that they are very happy with as well. We reached top 100 grossing in 16 countries. Uh, we were 58 top grossing in the UK. Um, the game um, had increased its revenue by 32x. All that with getting 150% return on investment on its user acquisition within 48 hours. Uh, it's still running right now. We're getting a, a one week of return on investment. We, of course, we're at a phase where we're trying to scale this growth and we're working with third time now on improving a lot of other things that Tilting Point provides, helping their LTV, improving the game per geo. Um, but it's uh, pretty impressive considering the game had already launched and didn't have a great launch. It didn't get great featuring, etc. Um, oh, I'm past the 20 minutes. Looks like. <laughs> OK, so I'll just go very quick on the last things. These are just some examples of uh, niche ideas that could be fun to do. Some are obvious, BMX, fishing, hunting. It's been done, but I think there's still room for it. Obviously, cult IPs. Now we're going a little crazier, music genres, bullfighting. I'd love to see a bullfighting game. Um, famous artist, we can recognize this one. And of course, this is our secret next uh, plan with Photo Finish. I shouldn't show that. And this is, I have no idea what this is. This is, uh, this is fun. <laughs> All right. So um, I think I'll stop here. Um, essentially, um, use proven free to play meta and go with new themes. Uh, that's the best way, in my opinion, to start a game right now and be successful in free to play.